Okay, thank you. Uh, we're very pleased today to have Lloyd Blankfein as our special guest. He is, of course, Chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, which is one of the leading financial institutions in the world. Uh, Lloyd has been the CEO and Chairman of Goldman Sachs since 2006, when his predecessor, Hank Paulson, left to become Secretary of Treasury. Lloyd had been at Goldman for most of his career, but actually started out as a lawyer. And before that, let me give you a bit about his background. Lloyd grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, his father, like my father, worked in the post office and um, didn't have a lot of money, but he got scholarships and did quite well in school, was valedictorian of his class in high school at Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, he went to Harvard on a scholarship, uh, graduated in 1975, and from there he went to um, Harvard Law School, which graduated in 1978, Harvard Law School, and then joined Donovan Leisure, a law firm in New York, um, and prior to that, he had actually thought about joining a firm called Goldman Sachs, but was turned down uh, by Goldman Sachs. But he later, after practicing law for a few years, went to work at J. Aaron, which was a commodities trading firm that was subsequently acquired by Goldman Sachs, and then worked his way up and became the co-head of uh, J. Aaron, and later the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs, and then president and chief operating officer of Goldman Sachs, and then, of course, CEO and chairman of Goldman Sachs, and has been doing that since 2006. Uh, Lloyd is actively involved in philanthropy as well, been involved as the chairman of the New York City Partnership, been involved in the Robin Hood Foundation, and has had the Goldman Sachs Foundation being very involved in a lot of really good philanthropic causes, including 10,000 women. So, Lloyd, when you were growing up... Gosh, I just want to say, yes. David, that's very impressive. I couldn't do that without notes. Okay. <laughs> well, I stayed up all night memorizing. <laughs> but, um, so... When you were growing up in Brooklyn, your father's working at the post office, and I know from the experience you don't usually think when your father's working at the post office you're going to wind up running the, one of the most prestigious financial institutions in the world. What was your goal when you were growing up in Brooklyn? Was it just to get out of Brooklyn, or was it to, to, to do what? What was your goal? Well, I'm in Washington, so I, could, I, I might be able to say that. I certainly couldn't say that closer to home. But I just wanted to... Um you know, I wanted to get out, and I wanted to see the world. I, I, um, I knew there were other things to do and I wanted to, I, I didn't know who I was and frankly I wanted to get out and have my eyes open. So when you went to practice law did you really want to be a lawyer or did you think about getting into finance for quite a while in your career? You know for me going to law I think somebody when I was uh, when I was uh, when I was young someone said to me when I was, I was having an argument somebody said you know you're like a Philadelphia lawyer I had no idea what that meant. Right. I know now what that means. Right. It refers to the Zenger trial and all that. But at that point, it stuck to me. I said, wow, it's fate. I must have to be a lawyer. And then when you go to uh, school and you major in liberal arts, like I did, law school is kind of an extension of liberal arts. And so I, got, I kind of drafted it along into, uh, into the profession. Now, did you ever think you were going to be an athlete? Because you were a great swimmer in high school. When no. you went to Harvard, did you try out to be a swimmer there? What happened? You were right. I thought I was a great uh, athlete in high school. And I'd say um, I was a great swimmer in the context of a huge community that didn't swim. Okay. All right. So what happened? Did you try out for the Harvard swim team? I, I did try. I, yeah, oh, actually I did because I was so stupid. I didn't know these things. And I got in and it was some long day. I said, what, what do you like to swim? And I said, distance. The longer the better. Uh, so they put me, this was, a, this was in 1971, and the coach of the Harvard team, uh, Coach Gambrill, actually coached the Olympic team in 1972 and brought some people with him. And so there was some long race. All I remember was that when I got out of the pool, the people I started with were already dressed. Right. And then, <laughs> and so I, I, I got myself out of the water. And without turning around, I walked, um, I didn't even dry myself off. I walked out of the building and over to the right. boathouse. And I said, I'm going to try something else. Uh, okay. And well. so then, not only was I a bad swimmer in school, I was also a bad rower at school. Okay. So you decided not to be a professional athlete. Um, you decided to get into... I had the right volume. I just didn't have the right height. Okay. So you got into uh, finance. When you joined Goldman Sachs, did you ever aspire to be the head of Goldman Sachs? Or you, you joined kind of through the back door as a commodities trader. Did, did you have any aspirations to be a commodities trader? How did you get into that? No, I, j I had aspirations each day to survive till the next one. Um, but, oh, you know, over time you get, uh, in everything else, I guess like everybody else here, you get more comfortable and more interesting things to do. I would say I never lived my life 
looking ahead at the next and next and next thing and trying to plot and plan where I should be. I decided that um, early on that um, I was getting too old to keep deferring gratification. I had to enjoy what I was doing at any given moment. And so I liked markets. It, I, I, basically what it was, I found something that where my kind of you know, near ADD was actually an advantage. And so there was a lot of noise and there was a lot of uh, inputs and you can watch screens all day. And, and so I kind of liked markets. And then liking markets led to liking economics. Liking economics led to liking business. Liking business led to the world that we're in now. So you rose up because you, you're the business that you uh, headed up uh, was one of the most profitable parts of Goldman Sachs. So you became, in effect, the number two person at Goldman Sachs. What, what was your expression when Hank Paulson called you up and said, I'm going to be leaving to be Secretary Treasury? Were you shocked or were you sure you were ready to be the CEO? I think when you, ha when you think succession in big institutions, and many people here are big institutions, you always think you, you have a euphemism for these things. You think of long-term succession and what happens if the person at top gets hit by a bus, in other words, a sudden. This was the equivalent of getting hit by the CEO getting hit by a bus. Now, I was in line, I was a member of the board, and so I knew I could have been in that, I would have been in that succession plan, but I, we all thought that Hank was planning to stay a lot longer, and the one thing that was kind of like getting hit by a bus without, without it being a bus, although it later turned into a bus, um, was that um, um, there was no, there was no um, um, you know, transition. So in other words, when, you, when, you go, when, you, when, when I got that call, he was saying, I'd like you to join me. I'm going to the Rose Garden tomorrow. The day after that announcement was made, he wasn't coming back to Goldman Sachs to introduce me to this, to you know, show me where the keys were. Well, so now let's go forward for a few moments before we go back to those, those days when you took over. Today, as you look at the economy today, you're now running one of the lar largest financial institutions in the world. You have offices throughout the world. Um, are you optimistic about the U.S. economy and are you optimistic about the global economy? Look, there's always near term, short term, I think you have to put things in, in perspective. Sentiment is very bad and for real reasons. But by and large, the world advances and gets better most of the time. I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the business of, I'm in the risk management business, so I'm in the business of trying to separate sentiment out from you know what's real and now sentiment all, there's an iteration because sentiment helps drive reality and, and and they iterate with each other but most of the time things do get worked out and they do muddle through and they or and they always have there's just a rhythm and a, and a cycle to things so we can spend a long time talking about all the problems that I have to go home and worry about and risk management against and try to hedge and adjust for but by and large I am I'm optimistic partly as a personality matter and partly because statistically things do work out and you have to figure that out and I could go through just in our last in, in the periods of these of the markets that we share together all the times that everybody was throwing in the towel and it was just wrong well we, in Washington we often now talk about the fiscal cliff suppose the president of the United States called you up and said many people from your firm have given advice to government leaders what can I do to solve the fiscal cliff problem? Should I extend the Bush tax cut? Should I veto them? What should I do to avoid a recession? What would you advise the president? Well, I'd say that the fiscal cliff as a major uncertainty in the world is responsible for a, um, uh, a, real, um, you know, a real burden and a real diminution of value and wealth in the world just because, um, uh, because uncertainty makes thing, everything worth less. And if anything, it, to resolving that kind of an uncertainty, and it's not just one side or the other signing it. I wrote a note earlier today arguing for, militantly, for moderation and compromise because this is really a march of folly to have things go between two extremes. First, because, um, first because nothing will get done, but secondly, if one side wins, as one side will win, you don't accomplish the certainty because immediately after one side wins and, there, and then takes all, the other side will be plotting and planning to reverse it two years later, much as happened in the beginning part of this right. current term and as happened after the House of Representatives won its election. You, you then go out and try to make it. Any kind of stability in our system can only be achieved if everybody throws in at least a little so that it's stable and it's that stability that helps drive that um, 
helps things to go forward. So would you recommend an extension of the Bush tax cuts, or you would not recommend an extension? I'm the President of the United States. I need your advice. What, you know, what? let me tell you, if a gun were placed to, you know, pushed and I had to do something, I would almost capitulate to either side rather than have these things go on and what you would, because that, because everyone comes out ahead if there's a resolution. So you mean certainty is what you're most interested in? Yes, knowing that things, will, things can always adjust. And I'll tell you something, when you're dealing with tax cuts and when you're dealing with numbers, there's some things in life, it's either or. When you're dealing with rates, you can split differences. That's one of the, that's one of the things that you can get across. I think one of the things that's a little bit you know, lunatic is the idea of backing yourself into a corner and saying, I cannot compromise on this. This is a matter of principle. I'll tell you what's a matter of principle. The matter of principle is that this is a country, and if you want to manage the country, you better not leave a 49% minority carping at you. Whichever side is the one that's lucky enough to get the 51%, carping at you and trying to undermine you and biding its time so it could reverse your majority. That's, that's what I, uh, so that's what I would strive well, for. Many of your predecessors have actually wound up as senior government positions, uh, uh, secretaries of treasury, for example. On uh, to, to, uh, to administrations on both sides. Right. I think five of your six predecessors have been senior government officials. Do you have any aspiration to ever go in government? I, I, I'll tell you, I have, I have aspirations to be desired. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> By a, by a president of the United States. By, by, any, by a president, by any president, and I didn't, limit, I didn't okay. mean to limit it to the United States. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, rates, and you were talking about tax rates, but talk about interest rates for a moment. The LIBOR scandal uh, is one that, uh, that has caused a lot of attention around the world. Uh, your firm was not involved in helping to set LIBOR rates, right. but what would you think the impact was of the problems that arose in LIBOR and the, and the falsification, apparently, of uh, what the actual LIBOR rate should have been? Well, people are driving it. I, I will tell you, the biggest, uh, the biggest impact that I'm feeling now, um, you, know, you, know, I, you know, the facts aren't laid out. We don't know how much it was affected. We don't know what they would have been had they not been affected. You know, there was a calculation. These weren't so wide. The, the, the question, you know, things are coming up as a factual basis. What were the motives for why it was done? Was it done to, you know, people who had the good intention of stabilizing the system? Putting all that aside, I think the big, and also the liability that could come from it, I think the biggest impact is once more um, undermining uh, the integrity of a system that has already been undermined substantially. And people are, and in some other words, there was this huge hole to dig out of in terms of getting trust back, and now it's just that much uh, deeper. And I think that that's going to be uh, a big burden uh, for all of us in the narrowest part of the financial industry, the broader part of the financial industry, business in general, because in a way, uncertainty is something that puts a burden on things, makes spreads wider, harder to transact, but also a lack of trust, you know, is certainly at least a cousin of that. Right. Now, let me ask you, you spend a lot of time in Europe. You're, you're a very prominent firm in Europe as well. Um, are you worried that the euro will dissolve, or do you think the euro will survive? Well, those are actually not uh, said. Uh, yes to both. I'm worried, right. and I think it will survive. Um, again, I spend about 98% of my time worrying and trying to um, uh, manage the risks of 2% probabilities or even less. So I think there is a not insignificant possibility that there could be an unraveling, um, I, but I really, really don't think it will happen. And I would say I do spend a lot of time in Europe, and I spend a lot of, and I just uh, in the last three weeks I was in uh, Germany, and I was in Italy, and I, you know, other countries as well. And the one thing, my big, one thing I come away with, and I could tell you, I know all this stuff before I get there, but it had such a big impact on me. Even so, is there is the, there is no doubt, the intensity of everyone, in, all business leaders and government leaders, to want to preserve the eurozone and the euro, how important this is. And I think people who live in the United States who grew up in our country and didn't grow up with that history can be more cynical about it than people who grew up over there. And there is an absolute commitment by the wealthier states, like Germany, and the needier peripheral states at the moment. There's an absolute unanimity. That being said, by itself, is not dispositive. Because in addition to the will, you have to have the capacity 
and there's always a risk that if a snowball starts rolling down a hill, by the time it gets midway down the hill, it gets too big to stop, so that's a worry. And another one, which is that you have to have, if you have the capacity, you have to have the mechanisms to be effective to stop it. And when you look at the governance and the structure of the euro, it's flawed. It's flawed that no country in Europe can borrow in a currency that's its own currency. No one has its own currency. And the governance and the mechanisms in place, and it's a, very, it's a form of federalism, but with very incomplete mechanisms for achieving the results that are sought and the results that you even have the wealth to accomplish. So I'd say all those elements are troublesome, but if you ask me, I think the most important thing is that there's the will and there's the capacity, and so I think in all likelihood, in fact, predominant likelihood, that it goes, uh, it goes well and it muddles through, although there'll be difficult moments. Now, you manage money, your firm does, for lots of wealthy people and institutions around the world. Suppose I was one of your clients and I called you up and said, Suppose. I, I, thought, I, I thought you didn't disclose who your yes. investors were. But, uh, I just said suppose. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm right. sorry, that, that was an inflection I didn't right, intend okay. to provide. Okay. Just doing treasury bills, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So if I was a client and I wanted advice and I said, uh, should I invest in Europe, should I invest in the United States, or should I invest in emerging markets like China and India, what would you recommend that I do with my money? I would say at any given moment, um, listen, for different terms, I would say if you're looking at you know, investments, and let's talk, we're not talking about corporate investments per se or right, business, right. we're talking about personal investments, right. I would say for a long time frame, I think it's easier to forecast the growth markets of the world and the emerging markets of the world 10 year forwards than it is to for, uh, forecast them 10 months forward. Um, I think the BRICS countries, the growth markets, there are certain things, there are certain things that are going on now that are clearly cyclical. But one of the great secular changes in the world today is the creation of wealth in these growth countries where that genie is out of the bottle. That's going to keep on going. Right. And, um, and they're going to have very high growth rates, and we're going to wring our hands and bemoan. And one of the things that's troubling the world right now is that China's growth rate may be going from 11% to 7.5%, but it's 7.5% for crying out loud. And maybe they'll have other problems, but over time, the population is a terrific population. They got the feel and the value of markets and investment, and they won't go. This is going to be the century of those bricks, and maybe even China specifically. Now, the 20th century was a century of America doesn't mean we owned every year in the 20th century. There were some right. pretty bad years, but if you, you know, there was a panic in 07, and if you took your money out in 07, you would have missed the last 93 years of the American century. Well, the firm, someone in your firm, Jim O'Neill, invented the term BRICS, yep. which stood for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. China, you're very bullish on, I guess, from what you just said. What is your view on Russia? You were just in Russia. Do you have sure. a view on and that? Say, mod, you know, let, me, let me be moderate for a second. We put out, you know, we put out, you know, reports and we analyze this to death. And don't forget, we stare on th at things in real times. You're going in and out and intermittently and want to know where do you invest money for the longer term. You know, we could be, we're bullish on all these countries for the long term, and each one has a separate dynamic that might make us cautious uh, in the short term. I think at a point in time when there's global growth around the world, then those country, those that group of countries that have much more of their wealth and growth predicated on commodities and the demand for commodities will have a better time when the whole world is growing and not as good a time when the, when the world isn't. So with a high oil price, the fortunes of Russia look good. And with a lower oil price, you know, it's going to be, they're going to have right. a little, they're going to hit, you know, going to have a little bit more of a speed bump along the way. But on the whole, their success is not predicated on that. It's predicated on uh, the, you know, the, you know, its population and, 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 and a broadening out of their economies. And what about Brazil? What's your view on Brazil? You're bullish on Brazil? Or? You, know, it's a, you know, a similar story. Now, we're dealing with these countries. They've, they've, they've had you know, problems in their markets, and there's a global slowdown. And by the way, historically, if, you know, when we've had these other um, you know, moments in time when the uh, emerging markets, called, subsequently called BRICS, subsequently called emerging markets, went, the second that the developed world would sneeze, they would catch the biggest cold and a fever. Um, that's really not happening now, but it is going to represent some kind of a slowdown because those markets are all riskier and consequently more leveraged to things going well, and therefore 
that trajectory will seem to come down more, but they're coming down to a growth rate that's still, still pulling up the global growth rate. In other words, the global growth rate today in this recession, with, you, know, the, you know, recessionary and deflationary mindset is still 3.5% or more for the world, while the developed world is much, much lower than still being pulled up by these countries. Now, today, do you foresee, do your economists foresee, uh, based on your own experience, a recession likely in the United States in the next year or so? No, they don't. And, and you don't. And I don't. But, you know, you know, when you're going and you're talking about recession, you're talking about a very technical, whether something is, uh, you know, the difference between a recession and not a recession could be two quarters in a row where something, you know, where a country goes by a quarter percent or shrinks, the economy shrinks by a quarter percent. The point is, not so much whether it's a technical recession, it's whether we're in a period of, uh, you know, recessionary tendency and where the trajectory of growth is not quick enough to change the, change the sentiment and get people to start moving. These, you know, these are virtuous circles or vicious circles, but if people start to feel more positive, they actually go out and do the things that make things more positive, that creates more positive thoughts. Now, um, you came out with earnings yesterday and your earnings were down a bit from uh, before. The press account said that this was due to the fact that the regulatory environment was forcing firms like yours to change their business model do you think that's a fair summary? And what is your view on the Dodd-Frank's bill? Sure, I'd say the biggest um, effect, and you know, we're quite open in this and have been open at this in good times and bad times, all of our businesses that correlate with growth. We advise companies uh, who make acquisitions or want to sell divisions and implement new strategies, which don't happen, and volumes of that go very low when people are insecure and not feeling good about the world. Um, we finance transactions, and there are fewer transactions to finance, but nobody's acquiring assets or investing in their businesses. And we manage money in the asset management business where the, uh, where the, where the value of what we do and the fees that we take in um, are better, and there's more opportunity when people are confident enough to pursue riskier assets. And I could tell you, you could not find a part of the cycle where all of those volumes and all those activities would be at a lower ebb. To me, that's the cyclical part uh, of it, and that's what we're living through, and it wasn't that long ago. You know, we had you know, record years as recently as 09 when, you know, as things were going down. Now that they're down, we're not necessarily waiting. Of course we're not waiting, but there are certain things that are psych cycles that it's not very good for us to overreact to, and of course things that are more secular which might include regulation, we of course have to react to. I should say, by the way, we react to cycles too, because cycles can be severe and they can last a long time. And if you get killed in the bad part of a cycle because you don't manage your business closely enough, when the cycle turns, you're still dead. But, so, but Dodd-Frank, if it, if it could be if, uh, uh, removed tomorrow, would you be happy or sad? Do you think it's a good piece of legislation or not good piece of legislation? No, I, well, those again, the, the second question was narrower than the first part of it. I think it's a good piece of, it's a good to address legislatively, and the vast bulk of it I think is good, and there are parts of it that, um, like you know, the swing of a pendulum that will go too far, and ultimately um, I, I, I think get adjusted, and I think the regulator, you know, a lot of Dodd-Frank as a bill was skeletal, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the very, very important details were left to a regulatory process, and the regulators themselves are having problems coming to the right conclusions and filling those in. There was a little bit of a pass to the regulators, and, that, and that's happen, and happening now. And so it's not all determined, but if I could push a button and eliminate Dodd-Frank, no, I would not want to have that field unregulated. What about the Volcker Rule part of it? Would you, are you happy with that? We no, I think, exactly the, I think the Volcker Rule, which actually came in very late, actually addressed um, addressed issues that were not uh, you know you know were not the problems of the system and raise the rule of um, whether institutions like ourselves can carry out you know will be able to easily carry out all the important financial functions that uh, that are that, you know that are that are frankly are needed so um, I think that that was uh, that that was and again the Volcker Rule as passed is an outline. It remains to see how the regulators interpret it. Now, you joined an investment bank uh, because it was a place that people aspired to join, let's say, 10, 20 years ago. 
Do you think young people have as great a career in investment banking today and people graduating from the best colleges and business schools or from any college or business school should go into investment bank? And do your children want to go into investment banking? Um, and I think that's, for my children, I think it's, it's, uh, there's the additional complexity of getting closer to me right. as opposed okay. to further away. Um, I think it's a, um, I think kids today are, don't, it, and I'm close, you know, because again, I have, you, know, you do as well, kids this age where they're talking and thinking, they're at the age where we would be thinking of careers when we were their age. I think kids now are thinking, what do I want to do for the next three to five years? And I will tell you, that suits us because what we have provided to generations of people were great, was great training. In other words, we bring people in, we work them very hard, they learn presentation skills, how to think, how to learn rigor. And you know something? There are people who join us and they think they're going to stay only three years and some of them stay 30. And some people come to us and think they're going to stay 30 and they stay three and they go to other places. But for us, we always get great kids out of school, some of whom really intend to stay in investment bank, and for some of them it's uh, investment banking, and for some of them it's the furthest thing from their mind. They come because whatever else they will go into, understanding finance, understanding how to become a professional, to work hard, to have presentation skills, um, to have, you know, to stay up a couple of nights in a row to get a piece of hard work done. Do you still find you're able to recruit the best young people? We had 12% more applicants than we had the year before. And as far as are concerned, we, when we get, we, last year when we gave out job offers, the acceptance rate we got back was in the, uh, was in the mid or high 80s. And I think uh, you know, Harvard would be pr pleased with that yield. And there's about 75%. So. That's why I know they'd be pleased with that yield. So um, today, uh, historically, Goldman was famous for being an advisor to people or to companies. And now you've shifted more of your business towards, if it's been called that, proprietary investing or trading. Or is that fair to say? And therefore, or do you get the bulk of your earnings now from things where you're the principal rather than the advisor? Or is that not fair or accurate? Well, we've always, I mean, we always, we always distinguish. You know, we make up, you know, we, we have these words that mean something to us and don't mean it, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything to anybody else. But we have always been in the principal business, much less so in the proprietary business. And the difference is, all the, many, most of the activities we do are principle based where we're taking risk and managing it. The difference is proprietary would be a subset. It's not when we're the other side of what other people want to do. It's where we decide to put on a position because we like it. We always did some of that. It was never the driver of our business or what we mostly did. Most of the time, the principal risk that we take, the economic risk is you want to finance something, we have to decide whether we can make a commitment. You have a company that has commodity risk, you come to us and you say, can you take me out of my risk and we take that risk on ourselves. To the traders and the quantitative strategists and the people who analyze the risk and are great marketeers, it's the same thing. But we're in the business of facilitating other people's activities by t lending a capital on the one hand and risk profile and expertise on the other. And that's always been the bulk of what we did. In addition, we said, you know, we're so, you know, we're such good marketeers, we set up other groups in the firm that didn't interact with clients, and they became proprietary traders who didn't interact and just put on risks that they wanted. We've already, that is something that Volcker addresses quite clearly. When the writing was on the wall two years ago for that, we shut off that activity but we're left with a substantial principal activity that we wield, frankly, so that other people can do their business without the risks that would otherwise impede them, and we shoulder those risks. Now, you are a, a licensed bank, you, you, you are a bank, and um, the kind of, um, uh, there was an article the other day in the New York Times suggesting that you're gonna become a larger and larger bank, or at least a private bank. Is that article accurate? Yeah, it's exactly. that one of our, you know, one of our strategies, I think, it, it, you know, they focused on that particular thing, so it has the risk of looking disproportionate. But one of the things, one of our big strategic pillars and directions to move in is saying, look, it's not a hypothetical at this point. It's not a question of whether we want to be a bank. We are a bank. We have the costs and the of meeting the regulations, the burdens of all that, the expenditures, the compliance, the features, the limitations on other behaviors of being a bank. 
So it's not a question of saying, should we do banking activity? What are the costs versus what are the revenues? We're also, we already have the regulation and the expenses and that part of the business. The question is, what incremental costs, incremental to what we're already committed to, would drive what kind of revenues? And from that point of view, we really should extend ourselves to do more private banking. Now, it's not our intention to compete with the big commercial lenders or the big consumer lenders in the bank. We're going to stay true to who we are. And so we view banking as more the banking that we want to do, which will be a much smaller scale than the biggest firms, to be an extension of our private wealth management, which is helping private clients manage their assets to helping them with the liability side of their balance sheet, lending to them mortgages, other kinds of financing arrangements. It's that kind of private banking that we want to grow, and also certain lending activities we can go into more. Okay. But I'd be, you know, we don't have the aspiration to be a trillion dollar, have a trillion dollar balance sheet dedicated to that banking. But at $50 billion, we could certainly grow it more than we are now. Now, when go back to where we were before. When Hank Paulson left, he became Secretary of the Treasury. You're now the CEO and Chairman of the, of the organization. And you were, what, you were 50 years old or something like that when you were around there? Yeah, I think at the time I was um, yeah, 50 or 51. OK, all right. Now well, I'm 150. Right. Um, so um, then the world collapsed and the economy had all those problems we know about. Um, did you ever fear that Goldman would not survive or that all these firms wouldn't survive in the uh, worst parts of the, of the recession or the, the, the crisis? If you ask me what I thought would happen, I'll answer that question. Of course. I was, I mean, I'm, I worry, you know, we sit around and we do contingency planning for epidemics. We study the path of the influenza virus because if there's an epidemic in the world, we want to know how we staff our offices. I mean, we do, we're in the risk management business. We spend tremendous amounts of time planning for or contingency planning for and coming up with ways of dealing with minor risks. I didn't think we were going to go under at all, but I got to tell you, I spent a lot of time worrying about much more remote risks than that was at the time. So in other words, it was not a risk that I enjoyed going, it was at a level that I wouldn't have enjoyed, didn't enjoy going to bed every night with that much, as much of a risk as it was. It doesn't mean I believed it. And so we got on our horse very, very quickly. So um, I know you had him here as a speaker. So. Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire Hathaway, um, we did an equity raise before TARP was, uh, before TARP was announced. Um, and from Berkshire Hathaway, pulled in $5 billion of preferred shares and then did a capital markets transaction with the general public for another um, five and three quarter billion dollars, of which we had a lot more offered to us. So I would say that we, didn't th we thought we were quite doing well and quite sustainable. And the external market did, too, because we were always able to raise money in the public markets. That isn't to say that, there was, that the level of risk wasn't so high that I wasn't relieved that the, mar that the regulators and the legislators were taking steps. You know, one of the ways which I think is disappointing and I think unfair is the way the community of the official sector is being viewed in hindsight. Because the world didn't blow up, they say, gee, you took these steps. Aha, that was bad. It was unnecessary. Well, it was unnecessary because maybe it was rendered unnecessary because they did it. And it might have been some, you know, it might have been necessary had they not done it. But if the if situation were to rise again, you had, this, you had to live through this again, what would you recommend the government do differently and what would you do differently? Well, I'd recommend that Hank calls somebody else. Okay. Um, do differently? I think... There was no, look, you plan and you, for remote conditions, but the world has a tendency of surprising you and coming up with ways that you couldn't have thought of. But certain pundits in hindsight said, well, you should have thought of that, et cetera. No one knew that was happening. If this, this won't happen again because people will have contingency planned for this. In hindsight, what do I wish we, the, everyone could have done better? Everyone should have had more capital. If you're us and people like us, you needed more capital, but you never would have needed it other than the event that produced the realization that you needed more capital. And so now, of all the things that are being done, 
what will be the most important thing and the most effective and the least damaging to the system is the requirement that every institution like ours and others similar to ours carry more capital. Everything else that has to be prescriptive, you can do this, you can't do this, you can do this if you think that, all that is, may turn out to be counterproductive. The thing that's most is have more capital. From the people who engineered the relief, and I think you should cut some latitude, there were a lot of people who took a lot of personal risk to interpret their responsibilities broadly and took risk, in other words, they didn't have personal interest at stage, they didn't get paid a lot of money for doing it, out of a sense of duty and public responsibility, interpreted their themselves broadly and did and implemented things that worked. So it's a little bit carping to kind of second guess them in hindsight. Now in hindsight, notwithstanding that, you know, they could have been more open, more descriptive, confided more in the legislature, you know, been more open, but there wasn't a lot of time to do things. Yeah. Now, after the recession is over, uh, some people criticize major investment banks. Goldman received its fair share of criticism. Private equity firms got their share as well. Why do you think uh, Goldman... I think we got our fair share and some other people's fair share. Uh, why do you think Goldman uh, was picked on perhaps more than others or got more, of its, uh, more than its fair share? And do you think that that was a misperception of uh, what the roles that you guys played? Look, we went first in some analyses. I wouldn't... I don't want to put away the fact that there was some... Uh, you know, bad behavior by certain individuals in the com uh, the real thing is not that there weren't issues. The real thing is that was extrapolated to a you know to a very big firm with very good relationships and a, and a over century long history of uh, of being very very important to uh, to to clients. And now one of the, so I, I don't want to put um, you know the real you know real issues that we had to deal with uh, um, away, but I will say I think part of the place that we held was a bit because we were a wholesale institution. We weren't active in people's lives. We had no consumer business. We, don't, we didn't advertise. Our advertising budget was zero. We had no dialogue with consumers because we simply weren't a consumer bank. There's no bank branches. People didn't know what we were doing. We were a little mysterious. Um, and that was a big problem. And then, of course, in hindsight, that was a mistake because consumers is another word for citizens and taxpayers. And while we didn't necessarily have to have a good dialogue with consumers, it turns out in hindsight we should have had a better dialogue with taxpayers and, um, and citizens because it turns out, and we should have known this, we pay, play a very big part in their lives. And now we know ourselves that they play a very big part so in our lives. So you've made changes in that direction. And so we then. make changes, and we know we have to reach out more and make ourselves aware. Now, we were always engaged in the public debates. You know, people didn't, you know, the general public didn't know our views of things, but congressional staffs, um, sovereigns around the world, big companies came to us, used us for advice. Look at the number of people, and this became a liability to us, shouldn't have. The numbers of people at Goldman Sachs at the height of their careers who would leave our business, our, our firm, and our industry and go into public service because they had that kind of mindset and that kind of commitment. And so we were always very much involved in the big public issues and debate and a very big resource for public dis policy decision makers, but we weren't known to the general public for that. And that was you know, more than inconvenient. It was, it was bad and it was a misstep. What would you like to see as, uh you know, when you are finally finished as being the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, which presumably is many years in the future, you have no plans to leave, I assume? That's correct. So what would you like ultimately to be your legacy for, at Goldman Sachs? You've had a lot of distinguished predecessors. Is there something you would like to say, this is what you did for Goldman Sachs? Look, I'd like to be thought of somebody who, you know, brought the firm through, um, you know, who in you know, good times did, you know, better than our competitors, made big contributions to the growth of the world when things were very, very good. And when things turn bad, I'd like to think of someone who led a very important financial institution and made a contribution to remind people about the reality of things and not let people dissolve into uh, and succumb to bad sentiment uh, and make sure that uh, we're resilient, have proved ourselves to be resilient and come out as a firm stronger on the other side financially and in terms of the contributions we make and frankly, uh, with, an, with an enhanced reputation, uh, which is not something, you know, in, with the general public, which is not something that would have been an aspiration before because we didn't realize the relevance of that to us. 
So no regrets about giving up the practice of law. You're very happy with what you did, and uh, you're very pleased with uh, your situation today in terms of the role that Goldman's playing and the role that you're playing at Goldman. Is that right? I think that um, I am not altogether sorry that I gave up the practice of law, although I did enjoy the practice of law. Um, but um, I, you know, we can't be, you know, we're not satisfied uh, with where we, we could never be satisfied with where we are. You know, all of us, we're all strivers. And so let me tell you, if the birds were chirping and the sun was shining, we'd find new things to do and new places to do them in. That's, you know, our, you know, this is growth, you know, this is not a zero sum game that we're in. We're not competing against each other for a pie. Our job is to grow the pie and make everybody wealthier, not for the venality of trying to get richer and more wealthy, but wealth in the sense of making the, uh, you know, the world stronger and healthier um, um, and, you know, for lack of a better word, better. And that's what we, you know, that's what we strive to do. Well, Lloyd, I appreciate very much for giving us your perspective, and I think you've given us a great oversight of, uh, of what your perspectives are. And I want to thank everybody uh, for coming today. And Lloyd, well, thank, thank you, you very David. much. Give you a gift. I have a gift to give you.